Good morning. Happy Sunday. Everyone, please rise. We're going to join the choir now. All hail King Jesus. Take her a hug. service with um, the Solid Rock, number 406. Good morning again. I'm here to greet you while our pastor and um, some of the other members of our church are in Haiti. They'll be back on Tuesday, uh, late Tuesday evening. Let's continue to keep them in our prayers while they are there. We have some morning announcements. Let's see. The first thing, I don't think it's in your bulletin, is the deacons meeting that's usually held the first Tuesday of the month will be held on the 14th, so that'll be the following Tuesday seven o'clock so deacons be aware of that change there are some changes to our prayer list also um, there are a lot of families who are going through some losses this week and just to keep you updated and if I get one of these wrong it's okay just yell at me and correct me 
Um, Bonnie Balderson passed away. Her funeral, from what I understand, is Wednesday at Namanai Baptist Church at 11 a.m. Um, the family and will receive friends on Tuesday at Wells Creek in, in um, Montrose um, from 6 to 8. Also, um, Agnes Henson passed away yesterday, I believe, and her funeral will be on Thursday. I don't know the uh, exact time or anything. Anybody know? I'm sorry? They had it in late. Okay, that's why I couldn't find them when I went to look. And um, also, Polly Gibson passed away, and um, her funeral, from what I understand, is on Friday. Those at home and people that we need to add to our prayer list, I do have one addition here. Um, John Rose is in Rappahannock Hospital in Kilmarnock. Um, I don't know the details, but just please keep him in your prayers. Anybody else think of anything that I've missed? Okay. All right, so let's go to birthdays and anniversaries. America had a birthday. We know that. <laughs> I rest assured you guys had a good one. Hmm? Yes, yes, there's a big birthday back there. Josephine? We know she's a firecracker, yep. 92. Who else do we have? Barbara. Barbara, that's right. She's not quite 92, though, right? 32. <laughs> yeah. All right, good. 29. Okay, that works too. Anyone else? Yes. Annie, how old are you, Annie? How is that possible? <laughs> Rod, okay. Okay. <laughs> And we won't ask. We'll be nice. Any anniversaries? Aww. All right. Uh, give us a song here. Time for a morning prayer. I've asked Wayne Carter to please do that for us this morning. Good morning. Let's pray. Father God, first of all, we praise you. We praise your greatness. We praise you all. Thank you, Father, for being uh, our Lord and Savior. We would pray, O oh Lord, for this country. Thank you for freedom we have to be here this morning uh, and to celebrate uh, the independence of our great nation. Lord, we love this nation and we love the people in it and we pray that you, you would continue to bless us this morning. God, and the rest, all the families, Lord, uh, this week that have lost loved ones, bless them, God, and the rest and keep them. Let them know your presence and peace and just be with them as they uh, go through this difficult time. Lord, uh, we know that they're in a much better place this morning that we long to be in one day, and we thank you for that. We thank you for that promise and hope. Lord, we pray for our military men and women all over the world. Bless them this holiday. It's always difficult to be away from their home on a holiday, and we pray for each one of them. Oh, Lord, bless them. Uh, if any one of them is in danger or Death, we pray that they would know you as Lord and Savior before they die. We pray for all of our, all of our missionaries, Lord. Bless missionaries all over this world. Thank you for the privilege we have as a church and a, a congregation and a, a fellowship to give to these people that are witnessing for you every day. And Lord, we would pray that the, we would be good witnesses. God, and erect all of those who are sick in our assembly, bless them and heal them and bring them back to us, Lord, and cause them to hear the audio word of God. Lord, we just praise your holy name. We thank you for loving us so much. And Lord, we lift all of these things to our direct Savior, Jesus Christ. We ask it in your holy name. Amen. Amen. Before we sing our
our next song. Um, I was not here last Sunday um, after vacation Bible school. I had to take a week off. No, I'm just kidding. Not really. But I wasn't able to be here. And I know I put a little note in our bulletin, but I wanted to say that if I haven't personally thanked you and um, you volunteered or helped out in vacation Bible school in some way, then I really do appreciate you. Um, it was such a blessing. And I pray that it was a blessing for all the kids. And if you volunteered, I hope that you enjoyed it too. So thanks a bunch for that. All right, so the next thing we have on our list to do is we are going to sing again, Standing on the Promises. So if you'll rise, please. Douglas will lead us in an offertory prayer. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for another beautiful Lord's Day and for this time that we can come into your house and to study your word and to sing your praises and for the freedom that we have to be here today. And Lord, we thank you for all the many blessings that you continue to bestow upon us each and every day. And Lord, we thank you for this time of the service that we have an opportunity to give back a small portion of all that you've allowed us to have. And we thank you for the ability that you've given us strength and energy, powers and awesome, which are so rightfully yours. And Lord, we ask that you bless the gifts and the giver. And we ask that you take these powers and awesome and use them for the blessing of thy kingdom. These things we ask in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.
uh, it's time to hear from our choir. I think they're going to be singing an oldie but a goodie. I'm sure they wouldn't mind if you want to sing along or tap your foot. That'll be just great. And as soon as that, um, as we get to hear from them, we are blessed again to hear from our brother Ronnie Hall. And um, so this is your official announcement that you're coming in, okay? <laughs> All right. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Kelvin Park Baptist Church this morning on a holiday weekend. I trust everybody's having a good holiday. Do we have any visitors with us? If you're visiting, <laughs> don't let me scare you off. We do have a pastor. So I invite you to come back. Well, as always, I appreciate the opportunity to be here this morning and as most of you know, anytime I'm asked to speak at any church, I kind of get anxious and nervous and tongue-tied. You've certainly heard me here before get a little tongue-tied. So as the pastor is uh, on his mission trip to Haiti, he asked me if I'd fill in this morning, so you guys, I hope you'll bear with me. Um, you know, most mornings, Charla has to motivate me to get a move on. She's like, you know, you got to hurry up and get dressed. Are you getting dressed this morning? Are you getting ready to go to church? You better hurry up. Well, this morning was no different. She's like, you know, running out of time. You need to hurry up and get dressed. But it reminded me of a story of a husband and wife. And the husband woke up that morning. And the wife said, aren't you going to get ready for church? And he's like, I don't think I want to go to church this morning. 
He says, well, why don't you give me three reasons why you don't want to go to church? He says, well, number one, it's cold at church. Number two, the people there just don't like me. And number three, I don't feel like going. He says, I tell you what, you give me three good reasons why I should go to church. He says, well, it's not cold at church. The people do like you, and you're the pastor. <laughs> but anyway, our scripture text this morning um, is taken from 2 Chronicles uh, chapter 7, verses 12 through 15. Uh, if you have your Bibles, uh, feel free to follow me. Then the Lord appeared to Solomon in the night and said to him, I have heard your prayer and have chosen this place for myself as a house of sacrifice. When I shut up the heavens so there is no rain, or command the locusts to devour the land, or send pestilence among my people, and here's our key text this morning, if my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and forgive their sin and heal their land. Now my eyes will be open and my ears attentive to the prayer that is made in this place. May God add the blessing to the reading of his word. Give you ears to hear it. 239 years ago, 56 men gathered together for the purpose of pledging to one another their lives, their fortunes, and their sacred honor and to gather to sign a document drafted by a young Thomas Jefferson, a document that began with the following words. When in the course of human events, it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bonds which have connected them with another and to assume among the powers of the earth the separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and of nature's God entitled them a decent respect the opinions of mankind required that they should declare the causes which would impel them into this separation. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, and among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men decrying their just powers from the consent of the governed, that whenever any form of government becomes destructive of these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or abolish it and to institute new government, laying its foundation on such principles and organizations that it powers in such form, to them shall they seem more likely to affect their safety and happiness. So it's worth noting on this 4th of July weekend, on 4th of July, not only that it remembers the signing of the Declaration of Independence, but it also remembers um, the death of its author, Thomas Jefferson, as well as his friend, John Adams, uh, another signer, who both died within hours of, their 50th of the 50th anniversary of the signing of this document. <coughs> Excuse me. I also think it's interesting to note that Thomas Jefferson, who would become the third president of the United States, would accomplish many things as a historian, as a philosopher, and as a public official in his lifetime. Desired as his epitaph for being remembered were for three things only. The first, the writing of the Declaration of Independence. The second, of writing the Statute of Virginia for Religious Freedom. And the third, for founding the University of Virginia. With this in mind, on the celebration of the birthday of the signing of this document, I would like to essentially talk about three things. One, I would like to talk about the character of the document and of the men that signed it. Two, I would like to talk about the character of our nation as we have now departed from this document. And three, the character of the solution God has revealed in scripture. The Declaration of American Independence, though no verses were explicitly cited, is an intensely biblical document. While there were no verses cited within it, they were working on a, <clears throat> on a certain assumption that the Bible is the cornerstone of all good and just political systems of government. 
The Bible had been a cornerstone of all humanitarian governmental documents up to that date, and they were working on the assumption that it was to be given to all future government documents. It was also to be based on biblical principles. But the text of the Declaration of Independence is especially built on two very important biblical ideas. First, that men and women are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights. You need to know the true meaning of inalienable, excuse me, inalienable rights, because this is a word that we don't commonly use anymore. The word inalienable means that it cannot be taken away. It cannot be given away. It cannot be deprived of anyone. It's part of the very being of existence. It's a part of who we are. And it's impossible to strip or separate somebody from which that in, it is inalienable to them. And they had these rights that were inalienable to all men. The right of life, the right of the pursuit of happiness. But why is that that's inalienable? Because all our founding fathers, they understood Genesis 127. That God, when he looked down upon his creation and decided to make man... He decided to make man and woman in a very particular and special way. That we would be made not in the image of this natural world, but that we would be made in God's very image. To use technical theological terms, we call this doctrine the doctrine of imago Dei, the image of God in man. That we are image bearers from conception unto death, we bear the image of God. Men and women throughout the world, throughout history, and for all time, we bear God's image. And because God has those rights within himself as something that is inseparable and as something that is as part of God as his character. We who are created in the image of God have these rights and freedoms unto ourselves, also have the rights and freedoms within ourselves of our very, our very being. So to take these rights away, they understood, was to make someone no longer human. We need to be reminded of this. That everyone, men, women, children, young and old, the embryo in his or her mother's womb, the elderly that are dying on a sickbed, the person that's laying there barely able to move, eat, or breathe, the homeless man begging on the street corner, the hooker, the prostitute, the indigent, they all bear, we all bear the image of God. And the founding documents remind us of something very important. Because we bear the image of God, these rights and privileges are to us inalienable. They can't be taken away. And we that understand not only that, that we have the right to protect it for ourselves, but we have an obligation to protect it for others. Our founding fathers understood that the British government of the day was stripping them of those inalienable rights and that it was treating them as they were no longer human. So they had a responsibility to those that they served to stand up and protect those rights within them. First of those, to life. Genesis 9, verse 6. Whoever sheds the blood of man, by man shall his blood be shed. For God made man in his own image. Because we bear the image of God, it is sin to kill somebody. Period. No ifs, no ands, no buts. It's a sin. So that makes abortion murder. That makes euthanasia murder. Beloved, that gives us a responsibility to stand up against these things that our founding fathers understood that we must stand against. To liberty. The state of being free from oppressive restrictions or enforced enslavement. The ability to act and be responsible for one's own actions. It is not man accountable before God. It is not man accountable before God's divine judgment. Indeed, they understood that this is a part of the biblical model that has been presented to us. That we need to understand ourselves. And when we understand these things ourselves, we have the rights. These rights cannot be taken away. 
the pursuit of happiness. Our pursuit of happiness, that is, so long as it is said happiness, that the said happiness does not rob others of their life or liberty. The second principle is a principle that Peter affirms in 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 13 through 15. That the role of the government, that the job of the government was to primarily do two things. To reward those who do good and to punish those that do evil. And they thus affirmed in the case of the higher government abuses their privilege or role severely, no longer serving the biblical mandate for what government was called and set to do. The lower or lesser powers of government had the responsibility to protect all those that were under them. This is a concept of what we call federal headship. It goes down not only in terms of our government, but it applies to our families as well. We, as fathers, have a responsibility to protect our wives and children. It's important for us to understand just how important our founding fathers understood that these, princip these biblical principles were. Benjamin Franklin, who was not only by any means a Christian, Held these, uh, excuse me, held these biblical principles as a fundamental, as fundamental for free, free society. George Washington, in his farewell address, that national morality is impossible without religious principles. Charles Carroll, another signer of the Declaration of Independence and a representative from the state of Maryland, he wrote these words, without morals, a republic cannot subsist for any length of time. Those, therefore, who are decrying from the Christian religion are undermining the solid foundation of morals, the best security for duration of a free government. You know those could be written today. Do you understand that uh, what Carol was, was saying here? He's saying that if you're not, if you're seeking to undermine biblical principles in our culture, and in our society, and in our families, and in our children, then you're undermining the very foundation that this nation is built on. Noah Webster, who was the compiler of the first uh, American Dictionary and Federalist political writer, and though he wasn't a signer of the Declaration or the Constitution, he did uh, influence and teach some of the
But at the same time, we also need to remember the second document that Destiny wanted to be remembered for. The, 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 excuse me, the document that was written to preserve the religious freedom in Virginia. Now, what he wrote that document for goes along in similar lines. He said he understood that government cannot compel you as an individual to pay money to a particular church or denomination or affiliation or to differ a set of different, uh, different beliefs than your own Christian particular ideology. In other words, you know, Baptists weren't required to pay for the Presbyterians and the Presbyterians weren't required to pay for the Methodists and, you know, it's a full circle of that. This document was never meant to strip religion out of public life. It was never meant um, to strip religion out of government life. And it was never meant to begin or to suggest that the government officials should not take their religion or their religious ideals to the realms of government to guide them through writing a document. But exactly what else needs to come? They took our founding fathers, they took Christian beliefs and they rolled it into their government, into our government. Yet this misunderstanding, this contextual has been allowed secularists or radicals to transform in our edu education system in our legal system, um, in our nation from what is intended to be an explicit Christian system of government and education. Instead, it's become an explicit secular one. Don't, uh, you know, please don't misunderstand me. I'm not suggesting that Christians should abandon government or abandon um, the world's teaching, but I am suggesting that the secular model is fundamental and corrupt and misconstruing our government and the way it was designed for my forefathers and meant to be. And it's led to a breakdown of moral and has impacted a lot of society. Since 1973 in the Roe versus Wade de decision, approximately 43 million babies have been aborted. That's 342 times more people that were killed in Hiroshima were the nuclear bomb itself. That's approximately one out of every four seconds. School shootings are on the rise. There were four in Indiana. All the way down to little kids. Violent crime statistics are on the rise. Pornography floods the streets like open sewers. Uh, political and Christian speaker homosexuality is becoming the norm. Redefining the marriage is now on all states. Do you understand that when we understand the Bible and going back to Genesis chapter 2 that the family, the husband, the wife, and their children is the most fundamental unit within society. So beloved, when you change that definition change the culture of society. Family is the foundation and what grounds it as a whole. Now we're redefining gender. Not simply in the terms of roles, but even in what it's meant to be, male and female. Beloved, these things are infecting Christians so often no longer live as an aspect of their lives or live outside the church in the same way that they live inside the church. We have come to the point where we will persecute and belittle and demise the football fans kneeling on the sideline of the NFL game. Yet, we are going to award this week, the ESPYs are going to award Bruce Caitlin Jenner. Because sin is the disease. 
It simply are a result of us living in that way and continuing to sin. So when we think about my text this morning and talking about the Declaration of Independence, what does the scripture say I should read from this? We look back at Second Chronicles chapter 7, the first phrase, first verse. When the Lord appeared to Solomon in the night and said to him, I have heard your prayer. Now remember historically, notice historically here what this is following. Solomon had just finished building the temple and they had just finished celebrating and sacrificing to the Lord. This was a big time. This was a high time. This was a time of celebration. Um, it was a time of rejoicing and, and, and a time of God's glory. And God says to him, when I shut up the heavens. The point of that is that it's man's tendency, it's our tendency, to slip back into sin. When I shut up the heavens and that there is no rain, or command the locusts to devour our land, or send pestilence among my people. Note the language here. Note the language of my. He is not rejecting him as his people. He has understood. My people. humble themselves and pray, and seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways, I will hear from heaven, and I will forgive their sin, and heal their land. I will make two comments to you. First, you got to note Clark's attitude. We are to humble ourselves before God when we pray. Scripture says that we are to enter into God's presence, God, Almighty God's presence. That, that ought to make our knees turn a little bit. Yes, rejoice in the privilege that we have been given, but it should make our knees bend. It should humble us knowing that God of might and God of glory, a God who is above all things, that says, yes, you may come to me in my presence. In your sin and in your wickedness, let me draw you to myself. Humble. Humble ourselves. That's a great model for us. And how we should be convicted by these words. Secondly, note our actions. Not only are we to pray and seek forgiveness, but God says there is something more. That we are to turn from our wicked ways. That doesn't just say, Lord, forgive me of all my adultery, and then leave those idols in place. If you read in the Old Testament, all the historical accounts, you'll find that when God blesses his people, it is a result of an action. It is a result of the king standing up and destroying and tearing down the idols that the sinners had put up before him. What are the idols? bring them into wreckage. And beloved, we need to begin by not only asking, but to take the task on upon ourselves and simply engaging in the culture out there. We need to do that. But before we can do that, we need to begin the task of engaging in the culture. We need to engage in our own lives. What are the idols that we 
Verse 14, then I will hear from heaven and forgive their sin and heal their land. Verse 22, then they will say, and these are for those who will refuse to repent and turn from their wicked ways. Because they have abandoned the Lord, the God of their fathers, who brought them out of the land of Egypt and laid hold on gods of worship, them that they serve, therefore he has brought all the close in a prayer this morning and after we uh, get these little pocket guide handouts that we might uh, I think the way we do up here at the church but it's a daily devotional and it's a 40 day guide that was given and I've been to it and it is uh, with my teacher who went to be with the priest of Bible but I want to close with a prayer about a day turned 40 this day turned 40 Heavenly Father Help our nation with its unbelief. Lead us into a renewed relationship with you. Forgive us when we find fault in our brothers. Help us look beyond their shortcomings and their evil that surrounds us to become a better people. Forgive us when we fall short of doing all that you have called us to do. And when we fail to demonstrate love and forgiveness toward those who have wronged us. Thank you for the blessings of knowing that we are forgiven. So, Father, I thank you for this glorious day that you have provided. Thank you for the opportunity to give this all to you in this place. Father, we're so thankful that the men that established this great country in which we stand here with Jared were all men of God. And we pray, Father, that those statutes and beliefs and the struggles that they endured to build this great nation of ours will somehow be shown into the hearts of those today you may be lifted up and that you may be praised and that we will turn away so that once again this country of ours will become a great nation as of God. So have to be praised and thanked for this. Amen. My hymn of invitation Thank you. 
Father, we thank you for yet this opportunity to just be in this place and worship you. We thank you, Father, for all that's here. We pray, Father, that you would continue to watch over us and bless us throughout this place that we preach. Father, we lift you up and thank you and pray that you would make them higher than us. Father, we know that you would grant that we need to be used in this great nation. Father, we lift you up and thank you for all you have done. Guide and direct us through the rest of this day. Be with us. 